All right, what's happening, poker people? This is uh, John Anhalt, and I'm going to be doing a series of videos, kind of an extension of our Polish Poker series, which is a free ebook, and this is going to be a free video series. I'm going to be going into um, as many different no limit Texas Hold'em concepts as I feel is appropriate. Um, I'm kind of subtitling this video series beyond the basics, but we're also going to be going into a lot of foundational concepts. I'd say this this video series is primarily going to target 50 NL and below players, but if you're kind of in that 100 NL uh, bracket, maybe even 200, there's going to be some things that you're going to pick up from here, so you can uh, give it a look and see what you think, but I'm going to primarily be focusing on players that maybe you are already you know winning some and even in a decent good clip but i'm going to try and really bring your game into some other levels and make some of these concepts as clear as i can some things that i use myself um, if you don't know anything about me i'm the founder of ace poker solutions and we do lots of different software like leak buster ace poker drills etc um, i've been playing online for about 10 years now which you know you know what that means basically I'm, I'm getting old um, but it also means that I've played millions of hands um, post Black Friday I do not play as much as I used to I used to be primarily a mid and high stakes player um, I don't keep a lot of money and don't feel comfortable keeping a lot of money online anymore honestly so I'm primarily playing 100 NL and 50 NL so um, I'm playing and talking to some of the games that I kind of, you know, just above playing myself. Um, I do play some 200 NL, but that's about um, all I'm going to be playing for now. And um, to be honest, sometimes it's a little bit like uh, watching paint dry when you've, when you've played much, much higher successfully. But um, at the same time, um, it's fun kind of teaching these concepts and seeing some light bulbs go off. So... Uh, my goal is going to be to try and enlighten you into some areas, um, go into some concepts I'm not, don't really, or at least I haven't seen other people talk about. Um, but we're going to start with square one. So if we want to be successful at anything, let alone no limit hold'em, we need to have a great foundation. It needs to be solid and we have to be building upon these concepts. Foundations weak, everything else is going to be weak. You know, you're going to be building a house that's eventually going to collapse on you. So, believe it or not, um, having coached, you know, lots of mid-stakes winners and things like that over the years, even though there's a lot of foundational errors in their games. So, if you think you're an exception to this rule, well, you're probably fooling yourself. Um, there's there's definitely um, certain things. Even I have certain cracks in my foundation that, um, you know, even if I, I'm I'm doing them, maybe I'm kind of aware of them. But you know, so there's like different levels. You may have them and be completely unaware. You may have them and have some awareness, but you know, you're still doing them. So where you're at. Um, doesn't matter. You you have some cracks here. And we want to kind of plug those up, and I'm not going to go into all of those foundational things um, in this video. This video, I'm going to focus on um, a specific topic in 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 positional. It's going to be about using um, position, but um, a strong foundation means that you're making solid preflop decisions, and and this is where a lot of people's undoing is. Um, I think also people that they start to have some success, um, also primarily in a lot of six max games today, um, the ranges start getting very, very wide because people start thinking they can outplay a lot of their opponents in a lot of situations. And believe it or not, um, if you actually kind of cut down some of those hands and made some better preflop decisions, you'd increase your win rate even more rather than trying to outplay everybody every single hand. Um, it can not only get quite taxing um, if you're multi-tabling, but 
it's very difficult to do with limited information. You're not going to be doing it as effectively as you might think you are. So I guess the moral of that story is sometimes you think you're better than you are, um, and you need to take a step back and, and realize that there's a, there's a way to make the game even easier. So um, I'm going to be going into some of that, um, but not in this specific video. Good bet sizing. Um, lots of bet sizing errors here. Uh, I've I've see like if I go into any kind of major poker forum, um, I could pick out you know hundreds and hundreds of of hands from people posting 50 and L and below, and lots of really bad bet sizing decisions. Um, so that's an area we're definitely going to go into too at some point. Um, aggressive value betting missing spots where you need to be getting thinner value or recognizing that you know you may be value betting into an opponent's better hand but most of their range is still weaker that they're gonna call with um, that is a huge leak um, and I, I see it quite frequently and uh, if people even just got slightly better in that area I mean it would totally transform their game um, so good positional awareness which I have bolded here. That's because that's kind of what we're going to be talking about in this video. We're going to go into some specific examples. I'm going to show you the EV of a very common play and kind of how board textures affect and change that play. Um, so a good grasp of, of hand ranges. Um, I put this as foundation, but it's something that does take a while to start to build and, and understand but it's essential if you want to start kind of taking those next steps in your game. Um, and there's definitely some exercises and things you can do and, and if you uh, email me or contact me I can give you you know some exercises that you can do on your own but I, again I'm not going to focus on that here. Um, I kind of want to touch on exploitative play and I want to touch on that specifically because that should be your primary MO. That's the area where you're playing against other players that are going to have holes in their games and you want to make sure that you're exploiting those effectively. Um, kind of highlighting this because there is a lot of hubbaloo about game theory and things like that I think a lot more lately and it, and it is um, I think a, a good concept to understand and to get an idea of but at 50 NL there should be very little implementing of it um, and I mean hopefully the reason would be clear you know because your opponents have all these holes and weaknesses you want to make sure that you are are focusing your bet sizing um, how you're playing situations in order to extract as much value from them from them in the situation balancing your range and um, you know keeping them off balance in their game isn't going to be as important and I'm not saying it's not important at all and there may be some you know very good regs in your game um, that do have some concepts of this and you can maybe check certain types of hands a little bit more more top pair hands um, you know sometimes some middle pair and different things of that nature but in general uh, I'd say 98% of your game should be focused on exploitative play um, and and how to extract as much EV from your hands against your opponent's weaknesses. Um, you know, so don't worry about should I be checking this hand 80% of the time and you know check raising at 5% stuff like that. That's it, you I guarantee you have more holes and more errors areas here that you're going to need to work on before this area starts really paying off for you um, and, and definitely it will as you start moving into even some of the you know higher small stakes and, and mid stakes games today but even in some of those or in, sorry in most of those this is going to be where you're going to want to be focusing and making sure that that you have this part of your game down and that you're exploiting your opponents um, bad play as you start getting against really good regs where their game and understanding is similar then this game theory and balancing and stuff like that becomes a lot more important but um, there should be very few opponents in your games where that is the case 
So we're going to get down to it. In this video, we're going to be talking about using good positional awareness, specifically about flatting in position. And uh, I'm going to start off by confusing you and saying, really, you should not be flatting in position very often. But of course, I'm going to do a whole video about flatting in position. So why am I contradicting myself? Well, not saying not to do it very often doesn't mean you're never going to be doing it. We want to be doing it against very weak opponents and against some of the weaker regulars that are in your games. Um, and uh, I'm not going to go into a specific range of hands from each position and what you should be, but I'm going to focus specifically right now on the button. The button should be, you know, that's your money winner, and you want to be super aggressive on the button. That means three betting, post flop you know raises all these kinds of things to stay aggressive um, <clears throat> and I say you shouldn't be flatting very often in position because anywhere at any part of the game pre-flop post flop anytime that you're seizing initiative to your opponent you're giving them the advantage so you know that doesn't mean that you don't ever call and and trap and and you know stay in with you know an okay uh, hand versus their really weak hand range and yada yada but in general you want to be taking initiative that's going to be making you money and that's you know we talk about that in polished poker so as I said be very aggressive in position weak opponents you know what those guys are you know we're talking about the fish we're obviously of course talking about anyone who's going to limp in front of you we're talking about any of the guys that um, you know like to call raises and then fold on the flop or or look up artists like we talk about on polished poker where they'll call a flop bet but you know fold on the turn a high percentage of the time those kinds of guys um, or weak regulars that you know are one and done type opponents they're mass multi-tablers um, they're not hyper aggressive or they're not going to try and um, get into a leveling war against you you know you'll know if you have a regular and you feel like you're kind of getting in a leveling war well that's probably not the person you want to be flatting with um, you know marginal hands which is kind of what we're going to be talking about suited connectors things of this nature So I want to start off by talking a little bit about the differences between dry and wet flops. Um, this is good information to know. Maybe you already know it, but uh, it, all of these little differences will make a big difference as you're deciding what to do, um, how to play a hand, when to bluff, etc. So, you know, if we have an opponent who's opening about 20% of his range, which we have marked here, it's pretty strong 20% from like say middle position um, on a rainbow flop like here in example one eight four three our opponent is connecting 27.97 percent of the time so by connecting we mean and you can kinda of see it here on the sidebar they're hitting a set 3.7 percent of the time um, they'll have an over pair 14 8 point 14.8% of the time, top pair 2.4, you know, pocket pair below top pair 7, almost 7.5%, no open in and straight draws, you know, they'll have a, a gut shot. So that that's including draws and everything that's really feasible for someone to try and continue um, on a board with. So, you know, that's not a whole lot. So you can see um, on dry low flops, this is about an average because it's going to depend on exact board texture 26 to 28 and a half percent of the time on low wet flops 29 to 35 percent of the time so low we're defining as um, you know eight or below and um, we compare that here the example one against example two where we have the exact same board we just change the four of clubs to the four of hearts and now our opponent connects almost 33 percent of the time so what does that mean? That's a 5% difference. But what it does mean is gives us that much more fold equity in a lot of spots if we are picking up on these kinds of situations um, 
correctly and raising and staying aggressive against um, opponents because you know most of the time someone opens they're gonna see bet boards like this almost a hundred percent of the time you know some opponents will slow down but most opponents especially I would say at 50 and L and below are, are just gonna auto see bet these things because it works for them you know it doesn't quite work that way as you start moving up higher in stakes because people are gonna float you more and more and and be more aggressive so but you can take advantage of that now you're playing 25 and L or 10 and L or something or another you could take advantage of this um, difference and 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 you know raise your opponents more or float them more and and, and things of that nature so um, let's continue a little bit of analysis here so now let's take the same 20 percent opening range that our opponent will have and let's change up the flop just by one card here so let's put a queen on there and we'll change the four to a queen when so we have queen eight three now on a on a wet board with um, two diamonds our opponent's going to connect 42.66% of the time. And again, by connect, we mean, you know, sets, you know, top pair. I'm not going to have any two pairs here because of how we set their range. Flush draws, yada, yada. So all those kinds of things, those are hands that our opponent's generally going to connect with. And here we just remove the the uh, the suit and we just make it uh, rainbow and it changes to 38.25 but you can see this these right here is a huge difference this is almost a 15 percent difference between what we had going on over here and what we have here between um, a wet flop with the queen high versus a dry flop with eight high so it's significant because now Floating doesn't become as profitable. Raising doesn't become as profitable. So on and so on. Those are important distinctions and, and differences to, to note. So let's take a look a little bit more and see what else we can discover. Let's go ahead and apply some of this information to a real world example and see kind of how we can take advantage of some situations. So, so here we have a so-so regular opens in middle position about 20% of his range, like we were just analyzing, a six max cash game. You can see here he opens three times the big blind and call on the button with seven of diamonds, six of diamonds. Flop comes four, queen, eight, rainbow. Opponent uh, C bets about two thirds the pot. I raise to six dollars and they fold. So. Here, our opponent hits this particular kind of flop 38.28% 38.28% of the time. Um, so, as you can see, we're risking $6 to win $6. So, all I need our opponent to fold 50% of the time to break even. Um, not too hard to make that assumption, um, even if you just kind of intuitively think about how often... Um, you have your opponent's range and what they're going to be continuing with here. Um, you know, of course, this is a dry flop, and you know you're not going to have hit this very hard too often either. Um, but if you're picking your opponents right and you have your so-so regs, um, you know you're not going to get them rebluffing you almost ever, um, or a very small percentage of the time. So this clearly profitable go ahead and raise because they're going to fold more than 50% of the time. I mean, they only connect to 38.28% of the time. Um, we'll push this a little bit further and kind of break down some more of the EV here because, of course, um, if you really want to calculate this out, you know, we're looking at how often they're, they're uh, re-raising we have to fold and so on and so on. But um, we'll go ahead and get into that a little bit more here. I think uh, the point I want to make in these kinds of examples is they they will happen, you know, a few times a session, maybe once a session or whatever. Um, and you know, I've coached players, and they think, well, I, I missed a flop, and that's it. And when you have that button, that's not how you should be thinking. You should always have in the forefront of your mind, how can I win this pot? You know, so in a situation like this where you have a gut shot, backdoor flush draw, and you have position, 
um, you should be winning this hand a high percentage of the time. And I'm going to break down some more of the reasons why. But this is a spot you know you don't want to be just zoning out and auto folding. You want to make sure you're taking advantage of it um, as often as you possibly can be. You know you're you're flatting in position to begin with because your opponent is not very good and and you know you have a high percentage of time that you will be able to outplay them so um so let's go ahead and break this down a little bit more let's say our opponent does call the raise and they call with you know eights plus you know a pair of queens sets um you know eight um Queen ten, queen jack, all those things, or even adding some hands that weren't necessarily in their starting hand range to begin with, with eight, with ace eight. But anyways, just to kind of give an overall thing, because no one's gonna just only raise X percent of hands. Of course, I'm sure as you know, um, that twenty percent will will differ or, or change kind of depending on the how they're reading the table and so on and so on. But Anyway, so, you know, we give them a pretty reasonable calling range. Against that, we still have 22.2% equity. So that should give you a huge bing, hopefully, um, you know, if you're not already making sure you're taking advantage of these situations. But, um, you know, that's still a heck of a lot of equity. And, and most of the time, let's say, for example, somebody does have king-queen, and they bet, um, and you raise here, most opponents are going to be calling. So what that's going to allow you to do is probably realize your equity 100% of the time. You know, there will be X, X percent of the time that your opponent is going to repop you here and you're going to have to fold. Um, some percentage of that will be for value and probably a very small percentage of as a, as a bluff. But most of the time, let's say even ace-queen or something, for example, they'll call... Um, you know, for either deceptive reasons or because they want to control the pot size. And now the turn comes uh, three of diamonds. Now you can decide, do I want to barrel again? Uh, you picked up, you know, you know, well, you only have one card to go, so your equity is going to be pretty, pretty close, but you still have picked up a little bit more equity. And you can decide, do I want to, you know, try and realize it all and check behind and hit a river card and if you do in those spots, like you run a run or a flush or something, or you do hit your gutter, uh, you're probably going to win a nice sized pot. So, um, you know, you add all those things together and it makes for a very profitable situation. So, um, anyways, so we, we take the equity we do have um, and what we're risking in the hand, and we only need our opponent to fold on the flop and, and on this play here about 25% of the time. That's all that has to happen. So if you now now and again, that's not counting for the times that we get repopped and we have to fold. You know that does factor in there, but there's a lot more factors um, that go in there too. Like if our opponent calls, how often you know are we betting and they're folding the turn? There's a whole EV tree that has to happen, and I'm not going to break down all of that. I'm going to go into some of the important points because I think you can clearly intuitively see your opponent is going to fold, you know, only needs to fold 25%, not including some of those other variables. So let's say they only need to fold, you know, 40%. Well, they're going to fold at least that often if, if you're raising there. So we were kind of talking about to get the exact EV calculation, we have to put X percent of the time or rebluffed, we have to fold um, and Y percent that they're just doing it for value. I would say approximately 5%. That might even be high depending on the stakes you're playing. They be raised as a pure bluff. Um, and 10% of the time that they, they do it for value. It's about 15. You know, maybe we could even say as high as 20% of the time, but I think that's really too high. Um, you'll face a re-raise and lose six bucks. So let's just keep it really simple and say our opponent will fold 60% of the time on the flop. Um, we will have an EV difference of about a dollar twenty because um, on those times that we have to fold 15% of the time, we'll lose ninety cents. And if we take the EV of the times that 
they um, fold and sometimes call. You're roughly going to be making about a dollar twenty um, per hand, or almost um, two and a half big blinds per play. So those differences add up. They they really do. Um, you know, maybe you run into this hand this kind of situation once every four or five hundred hands um you know that that's a difference um over time that that's gonna make a significant uh win rate impact so um you know the other small thing is like i said if you're picking your opponents well you're not really going to necessarily be getting into leveling wars you know you you will have some opponents that will fight back in these situations and if you're picking on a particular regular you might start to have that dynamic to occur, but then you want to take advantage of that. You know, you want to set them up and and make sure you're staying one step ahead of them. So, you know, for example, you're you're raising there with some air and gut shots and different things like that, and you have another dry board. Maybe you have a set, and they bet into you. You know, and maybe against other opponents where you didn't have this dynamic occurring, you might flat with the set on a dry board hoping, you know, because a lot of opponents will, will double um, with a fairly wide range, a little pickup equity and double barrel. Um, but in this situation, you would raise and then your opponent spazzes out, you know, and, and re-raises with air or, or just goes too far with the hand they normally wouldn't. So those are the kinds of things you can set up. But in most situations, I don't think you should or want to get yourself into leveling wars. Um, there will be situations that'll be appropriate if you, you know, if you have a regular that's in your games a lot. But um, you know, don't look to be flatting in position against them if they're competent and good. You know, um, if they're so-so or you feel like you have some advantage, then of course do it. Experiment as well, but. Overall, you know, don't don't outthink yourself here. Um, you know, try and keep it simple. Another important point that I just kind of want to highlight real quick is, you know, if we take that exact same range and board, and we change your hand from seven six of diamonds to ace jack, ace of clubs, jack of diamonds your equity drops from 22.2 to 13.03. So, the moral of the story is you have much more equity here and you have a higher percentage of the time that you're going to get paid off if you do hit with this kind of hand. Hopefully, the reason should become obvious. Here, some of your outs, like ace, an ace could be counterfeited or may not get you paid off, you know, someone, some of these players may get spooked when an ace hits, so you raise, they call with jacks, you know, or something, and then you do, you know, they check the turn, you check the turn, the river comes an ace, you know, they check and you bet and they fold or something, you know, it, it's much, much more difficult to get paid off um, in those situations, and and uh, sometimes your outs aren't going to be you know good here. Here, when you do hit your outs, your backdoor flush, your gutter, and things of that nature, um, you're going to be good a huge percentage of the time, almost always, and you're going to win a nice sized pot, and you know not have to worry about having a, a second best hand. So, um, those are huge, significant differences. Um, I want you to pay attention to. So kind of the moral of this story overall is look for boards that you can high, have some decent you know, equity where your opponent isn't going to hit the boards very good. Um, use your position and stay very aggressive. Um, if you do those things consistently, like this is just one small example, but you, know, you can plug this in and, and play with some equity calculators on your own, um, you'll see you know, you'll start seeing the difference and, and you'll notice how often um, people are letting go of their hands and it's setting you up for, for other plays um, as well because, you know, you're seen as being aggressive. And I'll make a, a side note about that real quick. A lot of people say my game is hyper-aggressive and so on and so on. And that is not at all true. It's not even anywhere close to the game. I have a pretty average overall um aggression I think my aggression is somewhere around 3.6 3.7 um, 
what I do do well is I make sure I'm picking my spots very well and um, you know I know how to check call in the right spots which you know flattens out my aggression I'm not always just betting blindly and I know how to raise in high equity spots um, or spots where my opponent's gonna have low equity um, and you know I'm gonna be able to force them off a hand so I do those well and I pick my spots well and my aggression doesn't have to be super high it just has to be smart aggression um, so you know it's an important point. I just want to, you know, point out because I know I've heard several other comments on, on other forums. People talk about my videos or, or um, hands or suggestions and think I'm just being a total maniac or super aggressive, which is just not true. Um, and yeah, it's it's just about having that, you know, smart selective aggression, and you do that consistently, and you make sure you're taking advantage of your spots consistently. Then you know that's that's where you're making consistent money. That's what I'm going to be trying to present in simple little concepts and ideas like this. Um, I'm trying to go into several different videos that will just give you a framework of some kind of tactics. Like if you've played chess at all, you can use tactics. It's not something you use as a long-term strategy, but it's something you can use in short-term iterations, which happens a lot in, in poker because people are coming and going constantly in online poker. Um, and you can use these tactics to kind of exploit um, your opponents or their lack of understanding um, and just just where they're at in general um, in, in their hands. And, 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 you know, when they are in low equity spots, you take advantage of that. And so wish you good luck with your game. Uh, I have several people that have even asked me recently, why do I do these videos and why do I write polished poker and give it away for free and things like this. And it's, of course, because I enjoy teaching. Um, it allows me to become a better player. It lets me analyze my game. Um, I'm hoping to expose you to some of the products uh, Ace Poker Solutions has because, um, you know, I'm... I'm a customer of my own products. Um, I use them myself. I know they have a ton of value. Just kind of depends where you are in your game. Um, but things like Leak Buster are awesome for any level of player. And Ace Poker Drills, um, if you want those foundational roots, that's a great place to start. Um, and just some of the other tools uh, that we offer. You know, I'm hoping you you know as you watch these and you get value from it you're going to become a better player and you become a customer and have a relationship um with you know myself and and our company and um i always like i said i always look forward to any feedback and questions whether it's product related or you know video related or just general theory um i put my uh uh, address or contact info info that's down there on the bottom of the forums and uh, links to our sites and uh, again I wish you much success take care